Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for this last in our journey of the uh, online virtual weekend of the National Institute for uh, Directing and Ensemble Creation. My name is Andrea Asaf. I'm the Artistic Director of Art to Action, and I'm with... Meena Natarajan, and I am the Co-Artistic Director of Pangea World Theatre, and along with Andrea and the Punker, uh, we are also co-directors of the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation. And before we begin, we both want to acknowledge both Pangea World Theatre and Art to Action, acknowledge that we're on the sacred traditional lands of the first people of Turtle Island. Uh, for Pangea, it is an honor to live, work, and create art and community alongside Dakota, Ojibwe, and all the first peoples in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And for Art to Action in Tampa, Florida, we are on the land of the Seminole and Tokabaga peoples, and we pay respect to all indigenous peoples, past, present, and future. As we grow in the work of decolonization together, we build relationships at the street speed of trust, and we endeavor always to move from acknowledgement to action. So we'd like you to uh, invite you, if you are following us uh, in the chat on Zoom or a live stream, to also acknowledge the first peoples of the lands that you are on currently. And um, you will be seeing uh, Mina and Dapankar um, a bit more later in the session. Um, but right now, it is my um, great honor and joy to introduce uh, this session to you today, which will feature Asian American directors and divisors in conversation and practice. This, there will be practice-based uh, portions of this session. So if you are in the Zoom room, the artists will invite you to turn on your camera and participate or share. And if you're following on HowlRound or Livestream, um, please share and participate, share in the um, comments and uh, chat rooms and also um, participate as you're able. We'd love to hear about your experience after. Um, so, in March 2021, in collaboration with the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists, or CATA, we actually gathered these wonderful artists who you will see today, um, all of whom have been uh, participants in the Directing Institute, um, co-organized uh, by Pangea World Theater and Art to Action. But we did not get a recording of that fantastic session, and it was so good that we decided to offer it again. So uh, Pangea World Theater and Art to Action are both also board members of Kata, and we want to encourage you all to connect, uh, get to know Kata, and stay tuned for the next National Asian American Theater Conference and Festival, which will be in May 2022. So um, this is also the last session of our 2021 virtual weekend. Um, as I said, it'll be a mix of practice and dialogue. And because the Institute is very practice based, we'd like to give you a small taste of creative practice with our artists. So first, each artist will lead a short participatory exercise. And then uh, in the second half of the session, Mina and Dipankar will moderate a discussion with the featured artist. So stay with us through the whole thing because at the end, we'll also be doing a closing of our entire virtual weekend um, featuring Nobuko Miyamoto. So we want you to stay with us for that. So um, here are the artists that we'll be creating with and hearing from today. We'll see their slide. Yes, Sumi Kim, Denise Uyehara, and Marlena Gonzalez. So as I said, we're going to uh, go one by one and introduce them uh, or um, be introduced to them uh, through their practices. And we're going to begin with Sumi Kim. I'll tell you a little bit about Sumi. Uh, Sumi is an actor uh, and movement artist and choreographer. Uh, as a lead artist, she created a trilogy of hybrid plays inspired by Asian American visionaries whose lives were cut short, including uh, Change, based on Kathy Change, political activist and performance artist, Dick T. Bell's Fall of, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, um, and Legendary, uh, which was based on uh, Bruce Lee. So um, Sumi has been featured in the Drum Review, Huffington Post, New York Times, Time Out New York, and many others, uh, and is working on a current project, a dance theater play about gymnastics titled um, Body Through Which the Dream Flows, uh, which features competitive gymnasts formerly coached 
uh, by Sumi Kim. So uh, with that, welcome Sumi, how are you today? Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting and nice to kind of virtually see you all. Um, so shall I just set up what I'm going to do, or I guess I'm going to talk about this video. I'm going to show you a little video of a performance, a workshop performance of the show that um, Andrea just mentioned called Body Through Which the Dream Flows. So um, alongside with being a theater artist and um, actor and divisor, I was also a gymnastics coach for many years, a competitive gymnastics coach and a choreographer. Um, after the 2018 um, news came out about the, the, the epic child abuse, uh, athlete abuse scandal led by Larry Nassar, physician Larry Nassar, that was like the physician for the USA uh, gymnastics program. Um, I decided that I wanted to try to meld my professions as a coach and a theater artist by just conducting a workshop with kids to try to train them to sort of like have some presence and do some theater games and some choreography games. And so it kind of evolved into a, a piece that I'm developing now called Body Through Which the Dream Flows. And in this piece, um, in this segment comes, it, it, it was uh, in June, 2021. Um, there are four or five gymnasts in this piece, um, and I workshop with them in teaching them how to kind of devise movement, gave them a sort of a theater boot camp. And this opening of this workshop, um, they're doing some gesture work, as you can see in this video. And the gestures that they're using in the space, their prompt was basically to walk through the space to accumulate these gestures that they had come up with collectively through a choreography generated exercise, which we will all participate in, in later. Just wanted to show sort of a sample of how some of this movement is incorporated into performance. So these are competitive gymnasts. They are currently competing level seven, eight, nine, and 10 at Chelsea Piers in New York City. So you'll see towards the end of the video, uh, I'm including this excerpt where you can see how the gestures are utilized at the very end over some voiceover clips. It's one of the worst sexual abuse scandals in the history of sports. Not being able to fight. And it went on for more than I mean, two decades. You've given up How did they get away with it? And you've given up your adolescence to represent your country. I think this is a role. Now, a celebrity like status in the U.S. gymnastics team. He was inducted on behalf of the university. The party family is so good. And he's a nice place. And he's a nice place. I should just add that that was, um, all of the movement was generated through prompts in workshops with the gymnasts. Um, and it was at Open Arts Studio in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Um, so thanks for watching that. And with that, I am going to conduct an exercise. Can you all appear please? Turn on your videos if you'd like to participate. 
So I'm just going to share some of the practice uh, that you just kind of saw on stage. Um, I like to I like to organically create movement that comes from storytelling, as I'm sure is a form in some in some form that a lot of you work or have worked before. So what we would love for I would love to have a volunteer to tell a story. And within this format of Zoom, if we can kind of visually see your hands as you're telling the story, um, that will be the first task. So anybody like to volunteer to tell a story? Doesn't it matter what the story is, the more animated, the better. We have the takers. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. I see a lot of good storytelling faces out there. We do have a backup plan if no one um, volunteers, but. Um, all right, Malik. That's right. That's my name. Hi, thank you so much okay. for having this session. Thanks uh, for volunteering. Of course. I've been on the other side of that where nobody volunteers, so I know how awkward that is. I think you all want to. You just don't want to be the first one to raise your hand. Um, so can you please pronounce it? Malik, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Malik, should we spotlight him in some way? Or actually, just let's just keep it the way it, it is, maybe, so everybody can yeah. see Malik, right? Yep. And Everybody else who would like to participate in this exercise, just um, turn on your video. You can just watch too if you'd like to. Um, so can you just raise your hand if you're going to participate? Denise, Andrea, Marlena. Hi, Olga. Amina, <laughs> Tepanka, and Idris. Oh, Stephanie. OK, so what we're going to do is Mal Malik is going to tell a story. And as he is telling a story, hopefully hands will be visual in the camera, Malik. Um, we'll just, you'll just pick up a gesture that he is using in the storytelling and just repeat it, okay? And at a certain point when everybody's kind of got their gesture and they're kind of repeating it, we'll stop and look at them and then sort of accumulate your physical hand life, okay? Mm -hmm. so, uh, and you can, participants, you can dive in whenever you feel ready to. So go ahead, Malik. Right. So when I was young, my mom and I were working on this field, clearing this field that my parents owned. And um, there was an apartment complex right behind the field. And there was a little child on the second floor of the balcony who was crying and just crying and crying. And my mother was really getting upset. She was so upset that she was hearing this poor child cry. But she kept working and I kept working and she kept looking over and she just got more and more upset until finally <laughs> she couldn't take it anymore. So she walked up to the fence and she said, hey, hey, you come out right now. Your child's crying, come take care of her. And all of a sudden the doors open up. This woman comes out and says, Hey, bitch, shut the hell up and don't tell me what to do with my kid. And my mom said, you do something with your kid. You take care of her. I'm going to call the police right now. And I was shocked and amazed that my mom was willing to confront this woman to her face like that. The child went back inside. My mother went and I got back to work clearing out those weeds. And I just always remembered that as a moment where she was just so bold and brave standing up for a child who couldn't take care of themselves. Yay. That's a great story. I mean, not really, but yes. <laughs> for yeah. us, it was good. Especially. <laughs> it's actually watching your hands more than actually listening intently. <laughs> well, I'm um, Lebanese, so we use our hands a lot, you know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I made the exercise clear, but the, hopefully you can remember one gesture that you liked that you want to, to repeat, okay? Because I know I noticed that we were just sort of going along with him and, and, and repeating his gestures. So does everybody have a gesture that they remember from the vocabulary of gestures that they can repeat? 
Okay, cool. I'm going to call on Idris to show your gesture. Great. Everybody copy. Awesome. Carla, you have a gesture? Okay, so do you remember Idris's gesture? Right, and then Carla's was? So we have one, two, right? Olga, do you have one? Great, third one, three, okay? So we have one, two, three. Mina? Great, so we have one, two, three, four. Andrea. Ooh, good one. That looks like choreography, I love it. <laughs> Super. Help me out here. One, two, three, four, five. I love the fist in the open hand. It's great. Okay, and I don't know how many more we can add without like losing our memory, but let's add one more. Adeline, do you have one? Ooh, good one. Okay, ties into the beginning. Beautiful, I love, I love serendipity. Okay, one, two, three, four. Wait, what's my, oh, four. Five, six, great. Yay, we have a dance, a hand dance. So what can you do with those gestures? You can use them throughout text. You can use them in sections by it themselves. You can use them in dialogue. Um, we can discuss this a little bit more in our conversation um, at, the end of the, at the end of the talk. So thank you very much. Handing it back off to you, Andrea. Hey, thank you so much for that, Sumi. Uh, I really enjoyed that exercise and uh, can already, I'm already bubbling with um, how it would build. So um, our next artist, we're just gonna keep um, throwing wonderful uh, experiences and uh, tools at you um, before we talk more in depth with all of these artists. So our next art artist is Marlena Gonzalez, who is a multidisciplinary theater and media arts producer, director, curator, and writer of Filipina heritage. Marlena strives to bring together the voice of the people and her ancestral heritage through creative expression and community engagement. She's a 2021-22 recipient of, a, of Springboard for the Arts Creative Engagement Fellowship. Um, and she uh, is, is um, currently in incubating a new play with Theater Moo after having co-directed uh, her play Isla Tuliro at Apengia World Theater as part of Teatro del Pueblo's Latino Asian Fusion Festival. Um, and she's going to be, she's teaching and going to be teaching uh, a new course on Black and Asian solidarity and community at the University of Minnesota's Asian Studies, Asian American Studies program uh, next spring. So Marlena, I know you've got an exciting exercise for us. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so, so elated to be in everybody's company. Um, I feel your energy, even if we're not in the same space, we are in the same time. So that connects us in that way. And we've learned to reinvent ourselves to communicate and connect, even if we're not bodily in each other's spaces. So one of the things that I've always feel, felt challenged with, um, having grown up and actually having been born into a bilingual um, environment, where like most babies would have learned their first words as mama, dada, and mine was in simultaneously mama, dada, and inai, tatai, or inang ama, that my brain is always split into at least two languages, if not three. Um, but that having been in this environment where English imposes itself constantly 
um, to push out the other languages. One of my most favorite um, and actually very passionate goal as an artist, as a writer, um, and as a creative thinker and community engager is how we transcend language. How can we communicate with each other without having to slip into the imperialism of English as the, the language of choice? And how can we connect with each other even if we're not bodily in each other's space and yet connect in an even higher plane? So I we have invited Depunker um, to be <laughs> our guinea pig. And I am going to present a challenge to Debunker. Um, there is a video that's only 16 seconds that we're gonna show um, and hold up the video as I explain it. And Debunker is invited and all of you are invited to watch it. And then Debunker has been challenged with um, the creative um, imagination of representing, reacting to, taking on a persona, um, from the video, inspired by the video, uh, or as a result of having seen the video. So let's watch the video, and then as soon as that's done, we're going to shift to Depunker and we'll see what he's come up with. Um, and then I'll ring a bell when it's like two minutes into the end of Depunker's improv um, to signal that you are now, you have two minutes to wrap up your nonverbal audiovisual story. And Let's go to the video. Oh my gosh, amazing. Can we put our hands together for Debunker? Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about your response to Punker, like very briefly? And for those of you that are in this circle, if you could pop in one word in the chat of your response to what you just saw, that would be amazing. One word. Depunker, how'd you come up with that? What was it you were trying to tell us? Well, those names, you know, it's um, Brother Floyd's memorial, right? So uh, just 
you know, the idea that uh, that we continue with our ritual of memorializing, remembering. That's why the Mina's glass of water was <laughs> here. For, so I just thought that, you know, the water, as, in spite of that, we continue the ritual and, you know, the idea they would not let our fists close, you know, and we want to get up, they always pull you down, pull you down, pull you down. But ultimately, you know, the memorial exists, the revolution is ignited and, uh, and, and, the, uh, and all of us standing with black brothers and sisters. So that's what triggered in me. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I know it takes so much energy to do that, even though it's only a few minutes, but it really does take mind, body, spirit to put into something that really expresses something from your very core. Um, so that would be an example, I would say, of how I challenge myself and how I challenge the people that I work with to transcend language and to transcend words um, and to really dig deep, 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 deep down into yourself um, to step into the space that you're trying to express or that I'm trying to express through you. So thank you, Vijay Pankar, and thank you, Mina, and your glass of water. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your words. I'm coming, I'm seeing them come in. Justice, solidarity, breathe, struggle for determination, vulnerable. I mean, what 10, what 16 seconds can do to us. That's the power of art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlena and the Punker, um, for that um, very moving demonstration. Um, and that was very powerful um, exercise proposal and also execution. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, the next artist that we're going to get to create with is Denise Uyehara, a performance artist, writer, and director based in Tucson, who has been presented in London, Tokyo, Helsinki, across the U.S. Her most recent work focuses on memory, time travel, crisis, and identity. She's a recipient of the MAP Fund, COLA Award, and many more. Um, and just these are just a few of her projects that we're seeing images from. Currently, Denise is in collaboration with Tea Loving and Jean Genevieve Aaron uh, O'Brien on a new project, Easy Bake, a project which explores queer BIPOC liberation. And you can learn more about Denise's work at deniseuyehara.com. Uh, Denise, always a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much, Andrea. It is such an honor to be with all of you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more after we do a little performance study. This is actually building on what the fantastic workshops we just had with Marlena and Sumi. So, um, so I'll just get right into it. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, about um, conversing in Chinese. I am Japanese and Okinawan American, but um, I was talking to a friend and I said, I had heard that uh, Chinese people sometimes write in their hand. And is, is that true and why? And so we discussed that. And so she said, yes, they do. Um, and so you will often see people writing the characters in their hand and showing it to the other person. Sometimes it's because they speak different di dialects. And so this is to clarify, but sometimes it's a homonym within the same, um, say, Mandarin speaking or Cantonese speaking people, of a, uh, and, and they speak the same dialect. So it's a way to make yourself understood. So um, those of you that would like to participate, um, I would love to have you jump on right now and share your video. I think we had, how oh, hi Carla. And Malik, thank you for coming back. Stephanie, Idris, all of you. Um, so let's take a moment, everybody, let's close our eyes for a moment and take in what we've done so far in this 
workshop and think of an ancestor and think of that person, what they look like, how they speak to you. And if they speak to you in another language or a language that you share, hear their voice. Think of one word that they might say to you. It could be a, a moment of healing or of anger or love. It's up to you. And hear that voice and then quietly open your eyes and look at your hand and then write what they said. If it is in Arabic or if it is in um, Chinese, Tagalog, it could be in any language and write it in your hand and repeat it. And I am, as we're doing this, because we are on Zoom and Zoom is such a problematic, fantastic way of communicating. Go ahead and show us what you're writing to the camera. And you can even be like, you know, <laughs> nice, nice, right? Okay, fantastic. Let's pause for one moment. So that was a so beautiful Levante day. Um, very nice. Now we're gonna add one layer of song. Who would like to volunteer to sing something? It could be a lullaby, it could be a healing moment, it could be anything. Yes, Olga, yes. Okay, now what we're going to do is, while we do that movement, Olga is going to sing. And I would also invite in anything else that we've learned today in this workshop, whether that be the bunker's moment of intensity in any shape or form, uh, or uh, work from the movements that we learned at the beginning, those can also come in. And it is kind of choreographed for these boxes, but it's also something just to study. Okay. And um, we will do this for uh, two minutes and I'll let you know when it's over. Okay. And let's close our eyes. And when you're ready, you can open them and begin. El pollito dice pío, 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 cuando tiene hambre, cuando tiene frío. La gallina busca el maíz y el trigo, les da la comida y les presta abrigo. Bajo sus dos alas están quietecitos y hasta el otro día duermen calentitos. Pío, 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 cuando tienen hambre, cuando tienen frío. Les de la comida y les presta abrigo. Bajo sus dos alas se están quietecitos y hasta el otro día duermen calentitos. Los pollitos dicen pío, 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 cuando tienen hambre, cuando tienen frío.
and find a way to end. And thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, so <laughs> impacted me so much. Uh, and, and I felt I had, well, I'd love to hear from you all in the chat or right now. What did you observe? Repeat back some of what you saw or heard. <laughs> I'm just going to say that real sorry. quickly. Sorry. Go ahead, Olga. I I heard my grandmother, and I and and I heard her word, and then I heard the song, and then I realized I didn't know all the words. I had to look it up, and I'm like it was so weird you know to like look at the words and go like oh wow i hadn't thought about it in a long time so thanks for that denise thank you for that beautiful song i was so moved by it and i love that it was also a, a, a struggle because i think that's part of the process of of learning each other's language and remembering i was gonna say I think the beauty of our hands on the camera and gesturing with our palms was just the most powerful thing I've ever seen because I kept like peeking in to see what everybody else was doing. It's just everybody like connecting. Uh, the word that I had that I heard from my grandfather was bangon, which is the Tagalog word for rise up. Um, and that's what I just kept writing on my palm. But the rhythm of your song caused that one word to mean layers and layers of other forms of rising. Um, mm. That was beautiful. Thank you, Marlena. Uh, some fantastic things in the chat. Uh, Kayla said, Pio Pio, a fine way to end, beautiful transforming gesture to thought, to word and to gesture again. Um, thank you, beautiful, a moment to synthesize, lovely song, Olga, repetition, power and poetry. Let's all just take a deep breath in. And there you go. So much power in this room and, and so much uh, creativity and I say response and healing, which I really, really appreciate, especially in these times. Um, I'm now going to uh, hand this back over to Tapankar and to Mina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciate it. All three of you, what, a, what beautiful exercises you shared with us, what beautiful practices that I think all of us could actually use these practices, are probably going to use these practices um, and add them to our own repertoires because they're so uh, beautiful at each one was so, um, you know, it kind of, uh, for me, also exemplified the people who come to uh, the Nas National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation. And all, because I think one of the things we're trying to do is to get away from, try to be uh, in a decolonized space. And in, in uh, many of our cultures, there is no separation between theater, the, the making, how we make the theater, the making of the theater, gesture, word, language, movement, you know, a dance, it's all, uh, there's no separation. It's not fragmented in the way that Western theater practice is. And so I, I just was, it's like beautiful. And, and in a way you could, each one of your practices, uh, even though it comes from such different places, there was also like a little uh, congruence, a little resonance. There were resonances in each other's practice, which was gorgeous and beautiful. So thank you so much, the three of you. And I'm really looking, we are really, both of us are really looking forward to talking to you. So now, now we are going to go to the uh, con conversation session where we'll be having a conversation with Marlena, with um, Denise and with Sumi. And uh, so before we uh, begin, you know, we are clearly going through COVID times. Otherwise we wouldn't be in these little square boxes, Zoom. You know, we would actually be in the same room together, meeting and exchanging practices, just like this. And so um, one of the things that, we're, what, we, what we would like to do is to kind of grow to pre-COVID time, uh, to, the, to, to 2017 and watch um, a little video of the Institute of the year, and, and this is 2017 was the year that Sumi 
Marlena and Denise, all three of, were at the Institute. So would love to actually have that play for us for four minutes, and then we'll come back to having a conversation. All over the country, there are beautiful people who have big ideas, who are working, and uh, we are part of the field. This is a place where this field comes together and has a chance to realize itself. What we do is not exactly recognized and respected as much as it should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what we're trying to do here is raise it up. It's telling stories is a way of healing ourselves and also being visible because many of us are invisible in this society and we can only come together in this society if we know about each other's stories. Un pequeño ejercicio. I chose a small exercise. A partir eh, del concepto de solamente un objeto, en este caso una silla, beginning with one object, which was a chair, y de la construcción de una pequeña mecánica de ejercicios, and the construction of a structure of movement. One! One! I see you. Thank you, Akoki Zamina. Asidori de Itini. Itini, it's what are you? Go. 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 I don't get it. So slow motion, sustaining the movement that you're doing. People are always looking to us for methodology and ways and where do we come to be students and to share that experience as learners and teachers. Uh, tip of the top, front teeth, lower and uh, upper lips and the sides of your teeth. The work that we do teaches people, you know, young people, old people, yes. people, how to value each human being yes. and not see the quote other as less than. You have three minutes to do this. Make sure you take care of The people that were invited to this, and I feel really honored to be part of it, is um, working with those that are very serious and committed to working with community and art for change. I think what makes this event special is that it is building upon at least for maybe five years of research and, and knowledge building, and it's done in a really smart way. This is the only one of its kind. That construct out in the mainstream, it, it doesn't make space for this. Mm -hmm. Not enough, or it appropriates and thinks it's making space. To make space for what that is and let it come through and honor it, don't question it, don't make me explain, but just honor the being of it, it's so revolutionary. It's the only place and the only space right now that exists I think in the world of theater and the world of arts where people come together and it's safe to not have to speak the dominant language and still be listened to and not be afraid of losing people's attention. It's safe to be older or younger or shorter or taller um, because that's really where the convergence happens. I think where we're divergent in our cultures, in our speeches, our, our manners of lifestyles, our beliefs, our faiths, when all of that converge is what's happening in this space right now. Everything is done with so much love um, and so much um, hope. I think the times that we live in um, are very challenging and for me, very frightening. And I fear for our planet. And being in this space is like a cauldron of power, of love, of hope. What's being generated here is the antithesis and the antidote to those oppressive forces that seem to want to destroy us. And to be able to do that through the craft that I love is such a gift and I'm so grateful. Boy, does that make me feel nostalgic? <laughs> you know, just the I, act of us being together, dancing together. 
um, you know, and having a conversation and these exchanges that happen, you can tell that there are exchanges happening outside of the Institute as well as inside of the Institute. And that's what makes it so beautiful because there's just like this true exchange happening. Um, so um, I guess this was our, like our practice before the pandemic, right? And so we experienced a tiny slice of your work in these Zoom um, uh, virtually. And then we're also at a point where theaters and artists are actually moving indoors now. Um, so I thought we would actually jump in and start with this whole question of what, what we're doing right now and uh, just ask the question, how has the pandemic influenced your practice? Since we just saw your practice and we also saw your practice before uh, this COVID, are you modifying your practice? I mean, how have you modified your practice during the pandemic and how do you imagine this impacting your work long-term? So, I mean, that's really a longer question, but if each of you can kind of take a little three minute dive each into that question, that'd be wonderful. would like to go first? I'll start because I actually right. wrote some of my responses so I don't forget. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, and I'll be honest, I'm reading right now so I don't um, miss out on the things that have been going through my mind. Tech-wise, I've observed and learned from, I've reinvented new ways of creative interaction. So very recently, I had the chance to participate in Theater Moves 24, our play fest, where six playwrights were asked to write a 10 minute piece based on a prompt. The directors, and I had the honor, the amazing honor to be assigned and to work with the amazing Leslie Ishii. I know you're out there, Leslie. Um, so we had local and national actors had 10, eight hours. We had eight hours to write. They had eight hours to rehearse and produce it the following evening. And necessity is the mother of invention. You know, it's actually when you don't have anything that you realize how much you have as far as the immensity of your creativity and this pandemic really has caused all of us to step up our game and to also find new ways to connect with audiences through new and innovative ways. That 24 hour play fest was fully produced on Zoom with all of us in different time zones and different cities, different languages, different orientations. and that the Zoom experience has now become a global experience. So at least for those of us who have done technology or have technology, I think the challenge is, and the irony of Zoom is, we see each other's faces fully, but it's a representation of us. In person, we've learned to smile and express ourselves with our eyes because we're masked and our bodies as we remain half seen in our mask presence. And how do we, make sure that we are not aggravating the marginalization for those folks that don't have the technology or the access or the internet or the Wi-Fi to actually participate in these kinds of events. That's, I think, the main challenge for all of us right now. Thank you, Marlena. Uh, I hope you were writing in many other languages other than English. <laughs> All right, how about uh, Denise or Sumi? I'll start. Um, so you saw a little bit about the gymnastics piece that I, project that I've been working on. So um, during the pandemic, we, I was still coaching and I was kind of looking for like an exit strategy because I'd been burnt out and long story, but what ended up happening is we were coaching these kids and trying to teach them through Zoom and I started doing some creative movement with them over Zoom and kind of having the opportunity to, to, to do some creative, creative movement exercises that there's no space and time to in a practice setting. Everything is like discipline, discipline, structure, you know, technique, technique. Um, so that was really kind of an eye-opening thing for me. And then something happened to our program that we're still kind of, a lot of people are still reeling from. Our, the head coach of our program was um, suspended and fired and um, accused of emotional abuse by gym, former gymnasts from years past. And this, this brought about a lot, a lot, a lot of kind of just, you know, big questions about the culture of gymnastics and stemming from the fallout from Larry Nassar trials. It became this thing that kind of like took over my life for that time. Um, 
we were all silenced. We're not supposed to, to, we were not allowed to talk to this person. There were all of these things that were happening where the kind of the corporate heads kind of came in on us. Um, and so the, the project that I started working on that I put on hold, I decided I need to sort of dive back into it. Um, alongside that, I did plan, an, the pandemic did afford me to plan my exit strategy, which was to become a freelance artist with doing choreography for gymnasts, but also like how asking the really hard question, what can I do to help change the culture of this dysfunction of, um, of gymnastics um, and abuse, whether it's emotional or physical abuse? And how can we break free of just being taught to obey and be voiceless? What does it mean to actually normalize talking about your body as like a young gymnast or athlete? You know, you're literally growing and changing in front of everybody's eyes when you're wearing a leotard and exposing your body, yet, you know, it's still not normalized to talk about like the menstrual cycle and the body changes and stuff. So in, in tackling all those big questions, the creative dance workshop that I decided to embark on during the pandemic was became this space in New York City, a studio where, you know, the cap is still seven. It's running now for the second year because of the pandemic. Everybody's still masked because we're in New York City and a lot of kids are not vaccinated still. Um, but it has become this thing that has really transformed my practice for me as an artist because it's like a real true exchange of like, I'm learning how to be a better teacher and a better coach and a better mentor by working with these girls. And they're learning how to be fully embodied and present. I'm making them do voice exercises. I'm teaching them relaxation and meditation and devising techniques, generating their own choreography um, and to sort of empower their own and liberate their own personal kind of um, their, their, their voice, you know? So it has been a real life changing experience that only came about because of all of these really hard hardships that we've all endured and gone through, especially being in New York City, the epicenter of the, the pandemic during that time. And uh, it became like a safe haven and a space that we could just sort of be together and be quiet and to be creative um, and forget about the day-to-day -day trouble. So um, I feel like it has really taught me a lot about melt, really truly coming to the place where there is a real confluence between art making, um, community organizing and act activity with, within your own community. Um, and you know, sharing, devising, and creative techniques to a generation that would not have the opportunity to do it. So that's basically what's been going on with me for the last year. Wow, Sumi, that is so moving. And I remember when you were in the midst of all this going on in about a year ago, and uh, just amazing how you've transformed it into something that can be both a type of activism, but also a, a in, within your art, artistic practice and stretching that. That's really inspiring. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about what's been going on for me. Um, in 2020, we moved back to be all back together in, in Tucson. Um, I'm originally from Southern California and um, everything was on lockdown. Um, I was I, I was and still I'm working with Corey Press, which is a local feminist press. Um, we have been creating Postcards to the Future, which is based on Letters to the Future, a book by radical Black women writers. Um, and we've been sending uh, doing social media uh, pushes around that to um, this was before, but also during and after uh, George Floyd. Um, and it was a way to protest in place because a lot of the people working with with Corey Press and um, some of the older uh, artists were not feeling comfortable protesting because there were George Floyd protests, which I did go to here in Tucson, but some people didn't feel safe around that. 
um, it was a very moving experience and I learned a lot from it about, well, first of all, that Zoom and social media and the internet is very helpful to have, but it's also, I was really, really glad that I, I could go to a protest in person. Um, so I realized I, I'm, I was eventually gonna miss that and need that. And um, so now two years into the pandemic, I definitely feel that I need to be creating more work again in person. Um, last year we received, or in the spring, we received a, a MAP fund to do a project called Easy Bake. My collaborators are Genevieve Aaron O'Brien in Los Angeles and T. Loving, uh, who is trans here in Tucson. So the three of us have been working around um, the idea of queerness. And I don't know how many of you remember Easy Bake Ovens, but they were this iconic thing from the 60s and through the 80s. They were basically like little ovens that were sold to kids. Oh, let's just be clear, it's to girls, so that they could bake miniature cakes that you could bake with, with a light bulb in it, and then it would come out, boop. So it was both amazing and fun to want one or have one, but it was also very gendered. So part of what we're looking at is that gendered message that was coming from it, but also around what we can, how we can examine um, and maybe change or transform or look at identity, queer identity. And I also should clarify that I am have been queer by identified since, oh my God, too long since the early 90s, but, um, but that I do have a cisgender male husband and we are legally married. And I, I like to clarify that because I think it is a place of privilege that I have, um, just like we all have certain privileges and I, I don't want there to be any um, like, weirdness, I guess, around that. Um, so I come with that privilege, but also my my collaborators are also queer, trans, and queer identified. And really, we are trying to look at how do we work and engage the community that is, um, you know, dispersed right now. And so one of the questions is, maybe it's not a performance on a stage, which was the original proposal. Maybe it is performance installation in which we create a space where things happen in that space that um, perhaps uh, change or transform identity. And that maybe it's only a few people at a time coming through and it, it might be a gallery space or with, um, you know, where, there's, it, where it's aerated. All those things we've had to take into consideration and for good or for worse, we're in Tucson. It's super hot in the summer. Don't want to go outside, but in the winter, it's actually a beautiful time to be creating because you have the advantage of being able to create basically all winter long outside. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, that was beautiful. Just to learn about your process and what you're doing right now and how you've kind of pivoted. I mean, I feel like this time has forced all of us to go go outdoors and then we're now having to make the decision of what it means to come back inside or should we, or maybe we shouldn't right now. Like, you know, what you were saying, Denise, or be in Zoom and write plays or work, you know, and, and how we work in our classes, the kinds of issues we have are so different from what they were before. So it was really, really interesting to learn three different uh, ways of doing that. Nipankar, um, if you want to ask the next question. Yeah. Um, uh, uh... I, I think uh, what I'm asking um, is about uh, the process which you're already uh, sharing. Uh, so I just wanted to go a little bit uh, maybe deeper. Actually, I often think, what if there is no, you know, nothing to go deeper, is deep right now? <laughs> because these are some deep artists right here. Uh, I, I maybe begin with uh, you, Sumi. Um, uh, well, you know, you, you shared... Uh, you, you know the power of movement and how your 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 choreography um, uh, sort of disrupts this uh, this culture of silencing and uh, and oppression. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, and I know that this particular trait is not found in all your work, but there is a certain kernel of you know uh, bursting out the silencing, bursting out of status quo and through a movement and choreography. So would you like to share how do you um, really change through your choreography, through your movement, this culture of uh, silencing? Uh, how do you devise your work based on this? 
your process? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not a um, classically trained dancer. I think I'm just a dancer in my spirit. So um, I don't have... I don't have a lot of rules that I'm being governed by when I move. I just like to move and I can mimic movement and I like to improvise. And I think that improvisation is so important. And that's one thing that I'm really getting these kids comfortable with because um, I've also, I'm also doing a lot of floor routine choreography. And so I travel to different gyms and work with girls from different clubs. And if I ask them to do anything in the vein of improvisation, they're like, they look mortified. I mean, and they could be like elite gymnasts who can do anything you ask them to do. You show them something, they'll do it. And they're amazing. You ask them to come up with eight counts of their own movement or a pose. They're like, no way, Jose. And so I, I'm like, how can we break free of that idea? You know, starting with these kids, starting with the, the fact that they are so gifted and amazing, but so oppressed, you know? in like kind of tied in tightly wound in this space in their childhood. So um, I'm really kind of looking at, and I asked the kids that I work with in the dance class, how can you translate that freedom that you have when you're dancing alone in your room to like the stage or the rehearsal space or like the floor? Um, and, they, and they, and so we just, I just started doing, throwing all kinds of exercises at them. And I really think, and I remember doing this at the um, at the, the NIDEC in 2017 with Teo. I remember that um, he made us dance for 30 minutes without stopping. <laughs> and they kind of like dig into a trance. Um, I think that's a real, really important thing for everybody to do, no matter how old you are, where you're coming from, ability, able body or whatever. It's like, just move, just move every day, just put on some music. Um, I, I find that that really connects you to he, who you are. And with these kids, especially, it sort of gives them this impact. I don't wanna say empowerment, but they are like getting to know who they are. And if you know who you are, if you can check into your body, if you can like, you know, understand what it is to, to breathe, and to scan yourself of injuries or like trauma or, you know, oppression, then if, then you're going to become a more, uh, just a stronger human being. So I'm trying to do that with these kids to get them to improvise, to get them to just like translate that ability to just play into movement and take it into their life. Well, that was a long answer, and I'm not sure if it was very succinct. But uh, uh, no, uh, about like unsilencing and, and yes, and yes. I yes. often come from improvisation and then kind of go, "Oh, I like that. I like didn't like that," and videotape myself doing it, and also use text. A lot of text. I use. I take phrases or words, and I kind of create movement from from phrases or words, and the gestures that we did earlier um, from storytelling. Those type of things you can distill and make them very small, repeat them over and over again, or you can expand them. Um, and I feel like that's also a very good device to, to use for uh, non, non dance traditional dancers. Um, and, uh, and it becomes this sort of like composition or theme and variation that you can, that you can use that's sort of tied into your personal storytelling and your own mythology. So. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. you know, uh, philosophically in Upanishads in India, there is a saying which says, why does it take the longest amount of time to cover the shortest distance between you and your soul? So mm -hmm. ultimately, we learn all these vocabulary ultimately to disrobe, you know, and get down to that truth, naked truth uh, of what do we want to say with our own uh, nomenclature and uh, I hear you I hear the power of the work that you are doing and it's so inspiring uh, so inspiring uh, uh, you know uh, I always feel if I'm if I uh, in my schooling years um, which is still continuing I mean if I had teachers like this I don't think I'll go into a classroom I will go to Sumi go to Denise go to Malina uh, you know that'll be a radical radical education Makes you uh, take a look at how at how 
how much structure and how confining the way we learn, like music is, you know, reading music first, not really being taught to improvise. And then the fear that, that you have later in life of like expressing your own ideas. Yes, yes. Like, you know. Yeah. Uh, even knowing that there are other cultures that have that uh, very different way right. of uh, accessing, you know, the, the, the different forms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sumi. Uh, I mean, I know that, you know, we can spend days on each of your work mm -hmm. processes. Um, um, uh, I would like to, so that Denise is not the, uh, the third person in this sequence. So I want to jump to Denise, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, beyond that calm exterior lies some Vesuvius of fire. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, so Denise, uh, about your process, you know, uh, I've, I've really been present to your pro uh, method of creating uh, and I've seen your finished products. Uh, and I think one thing that uh, I remember having a conversation with Leslie when we participated uh, uh, in our one of our improv uh, with you and your mentee created for us, um, you know, layering. Uh, no, we are not talking about what uh, what uh, you know Marcos costumes Nahara. you're wearing. No, no, uh, <laughs> about your layering. That that that's uh, when I think of your work, Denise. I just like you just take uh, you know it's like layered. Uh, you take an action, you put it, then you take another action, you put it, then you take an improv, you put it, then you take a clothing, you put it. And then ultimately when we see it together, it's like unbelievable vocabulary that emerges from it. So would you like to just share uh, a part of your devising or your work? Uh, how do you arrive at those? And, and when do you know that the layering is over? <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, in, in preparing for this panel, I actually thought, oh, we're talking about, you know, like it made me really think back to where did all this come from in me? And I, I realized that, I, you know, I've always been creating, always wanted to tell stories, but around the time when I was early in college, I switched from, because I'm Asian American, I was in biology, but then I switched to comparative literature. And I did that partly because I knew I could get out on time um, but I could also walk across the campus to the radical people, the drama people, the art people, and take, you know, acting classes. And there was a, an audition, a South Asian British director wanted to aud audition us for um, FOB, which is the David Henry Huang play from the 80s. And um, there weren't enough people. It's only a three-person play. There weren't enough actors who auditioned. I was one of them. So she had to change it and she said, we're going to do Conference of the Birds, which is um, an, ad an adapted from a, a Sufi poet whose name I'm going to say because I, I feel like it's important is Farid Undin Attar. Um, and it was adapted or co-opted by Peter Brook and uh, Jean-Claude uh, Carrier. And um, the thing that was I realized in retrospect was so important was she made us improv all the time. It, we didn't even look at a script for like the first two weeks. And uh, that was my experience into theater. And also the graduate students who were also in the ensemble said, hey, you know, at night we go to this barn and we don't pee all night and we have to like do all these crazy performance pieces. And this Polish director named Jerzy Grotowski is teaching us you want to come? And I was like, oh, no, that sounds really weird. So in retrospect, that's what was going on. And that energy and that way of entering into work was right there in the space because they were bringing it in. So that's what I always thought. That's what I thought theater was, actually, because I didn't know any better. Um, not and to, I, not was, to pee the entire night. <laughs> <laughs> it was not to pee the entire night, but it was just um, that intensity. And I think what I learned from that is that um, I when I moved to Los Angeles and started just doing theater and was straddling between I was performance space and Los Angeles Theater Center and Mark Tate Perform and doing both the legitimate theater and performance work. I just always thought that theater and performance was whoever was in the room that was who needed to be there. And it was highly improvisational and gener you were generating work you didn't need sets or lights or sound basically you just needed to create a language right like you create a language and then you 
you present it and you share it and the audience begins to understand it and go on that journey with you. And so in the, I think the layering, I started to realize that's what we were always doing when we were ensemble on stage together in different, different places in a space. We were like um, simultaneously creating music or singing, or someone would be like dancing in the corner. And it was all happening at the same time, but with a skilled director, we were able to weave it together. And all those things, um, I got to work with choreographer Vic Marks, who said, that's new information you're adding every time. And that it's not necessarily specifically dates and times that you're going to convey, but the new information that is found in your body will be the information that you can use and add through these layers. And I do feel that the world is super complex and very contradictory. So I also believe that um, I had a mentor uh, who told me once, uh, Marta Savigliano, who said, you know, human beings are able to hold contradictory ideas in their minds. Their brains will not explode and you can you can present that information and they can take it in because we do it all the time in life so yeah and uh denise i i did just, just an addendum to uh, to your sharing um i also remember you know i was asking you while you were creating and you were just uh, like electricity you were just going and i i asked you that uh that i said what do you mean uh, you added another layer where suddenly saw leslie was pouring water from top <laughs> and i said so but uh, will will the uh, what does that mean and, and uh, will the audience know what it means and i remember you saying it, it, it does not matter uh, what it means because you never know how the audience will receive it when they see all the layers so it is not that you semantically explain every layer but overall, it becomes a, uh, a sort of a melody. Yes, yes, I think so. And thank you to Bunker for participating in that. You were so game to, and brought bringing in a traditional martial art to it, singing. There was also blue lipstick on the Bunker. <laughs> but yeah, and, and Leslie, <laughs> thank you so much. And Marcus Legendary. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all those things. I, I, I did scream when I saw the blue lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a piece that my men mentee, Marcos Nahara, who's a fantastic artist in his own right, he wanted to do that piece. So that's what we came up with. It was fantastic. You did answer the question. You, I, you talked about the my blue lipstick, which was not the question. <laughs> that was it. This is the, the blue lipstick. That, you know, because there was like high camp going on in that, you know, catwalk. And then there was like, you know, very intense things, the storytelling and, you know, waterfalls and things. So, you know, but it's kind of, and, and then at a certain point, it's like just figuring out as a director what you need to cut, to cut away to make the piece make sense, coherent sense, which is, I did learn partly from traditional theater training, but from just watching directors direct my work and things like that, because it's like, I feel like it's important to have both um, and to balance it and to have one eye inside and one inside mm. of the work. And, and, and so uh, uh, it's not, so when you're creating layering like this, uh, uh, Denise, uh, you, you, you do not have a, you have not, you do not have a clarity of the arrival uh, narrative, right? You don't know where you're, where you're going to arrive. I mean, even Sumi talked about, you know, improvising initially, you know, as a process. So when you're layering, you, if you, you don't necessarily have to have figured out what each layers are, each layer is. Yeah. I don't think I would say also to Marlena and Sumi. Yeah. I think we all just, it's, it's a, it's a journey. And uh, I think even though we, you might have a script that you're working with, it's still within that there's a, there are your interpretations and personal way of making it personal. And I think that voice, which is something Sumi was talking about of having, finding that the voice and presence through the work and making it personal to you is empowerment. And Sumi, I was going to mention when you're talking about gymnasts and what they go through, it reminded me so much of what actors in particular female actors go through about feeling that they had to be a certain way. And I uh, didn't experience that because I wasn't a theater actor. I was more like a performance artist. So, and I always 
just assume that everybody was making their own work, but I realize now they weren't, they were being told what to do, which is, it's fine. It's a different thing, but it's, I think it's really fantastic to have, to be able to create. Yeah. Th thank, thank you. Th uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, uh, now we come, uh, come to my, my, my peeps in Minneapolis. Uh, Marlena, I know that your room does not look that neat. Uh, you know the way you have <laughs> decorated that uh, the uh, you know your room for the uh, <laughs> it's a performative decoration. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Marlena, I I uh, wanted to uh, because I know of your work. I know circumstances with which you have created uh, throughout your life and uh, what you shared in your presentation today. Um, I know it is, but I'm not asking you for a specificity of it. Uh, where you said that where when you don't have anything you realize how much you have you know in the context from from the land from where you hail to your work over here you have you know your politics of location is so strong in large white spaces in your own space you negotiate and you constantly create this powerful uh, language um, so how how what, what makes you continue to create the work that you do, uh, whether you have things or not, can you, you, as a part of your process? I think, so I grew up in the third world, the third world. I grew up in, in Manila, um, experienced martial law. And when things are taken away from you is when you, I mean, this sounds so cliche, like, is when you realize how valuable they are. And the ones that get taken away from you that you didn't care about, you realize you just needed to release them and thank you world for taking that away from me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the experience of scarcity teaches us abundance. The experience of fear teaches us courage. I remember as a kid, I people would always say that I was brave. Like, you know, you get these injections and I'm always the first one volunteering, offering my arm because I wanted to show all my cousins and that I was not going to cry. And I was crying inside, but I, you know, they stick the needle in and I put on this visage of courage. And it was only realizing that I wasn't really being brave because I was performing already. And that the people who were really brave was my cousin who would like jump on my mother's lap and cry his head off because he did not want to be injected. He was the brave one because in spite of it, he went through it. I was not being brave. I was just like, okay, I just went with it. And I think in the work that we do, we're so much into like performance, right? Meaning you get seen, you get heard, your words, get interpreted um, people applaud you or people boo you for the work that you've done but really the very essence of it is listening before anything else before anything else even in the morning the, before anything else listening is the first gesture to honor where you are and and where you stand because if we don't listen i mean we can hear like we especially here in Minneapolis when, when um, George Floyd's murder happened and we were surrounded by the cacophony of protest and media news was reporting about it like crazy. Media could hear the noise, but the media was not listening. And that's the huge difference. As artists, I think we become powerful writers, directors, actors, performers, musicians, dancers, choreographers, designers, and it becomes an ensemble when you're listening to each other. And when there is one member in the ensemble or the crew or the cast that doesn't seem to be listening, that's when all hands on deck, then you focus on the one that doesn't seem to be listening because if there is somebody seemingly out of sync, that's where the work is first mm. before everything else. I mean, you know, we, we like to cast, um, or direct to work with people that we love and know already. But I think the real adventure is in going somewhere <laughs> that you don't know is going to happen. Um, I wanted to, like, as an example, one of the things I did this summer is through the, the um, Our Space is Spoken For Fellowship with Twin Cities Media Alliance. 
And we had to create public performances based on com community storytellers, stories that were told to us. I was partnered with the most uncanny, most divergent, different artist to work with. Orko, Orko Elohim is a sound designer, avant-garde rap artist, hip hop artist who worked with Chaco Mali, who's a curated a show at Minneapolis Institute of the Arts. And Orko was into Afrofuturism. And I told him, you like your whole aura is Sun Ra. And I was in the beginning, I was scared because I didn't know what to do with him. And he didn't know what to do with me. Like we were not speaking the same language and I don't mean English. I meant that our process and our thinking and our the, the, the diegetic time involved in our creation were so vastly different. We clashed so much, but we were being very polite with each other because we didn't want to ruin the timeline that we had to deal with. But in that clashing was so much learning that we realized there were stories between us, between an Asian American and an African American artist. There was so much that we are not saying to each other because we were afraid. We were so afraid to turn each other off. We were so afraid not to meet our deadline. And we were so afraid to just be honest with each other and to say what our own stereotypes are of each other. Um, and that was more of a learning experience than trying to actually make a performance. And the result of it was that we each realized there are ingredients in our own lives that we put on the table and find a way to combine. And so, I mean, to this day, I say that was like one of the hardest partnerships that I've ever worked with because a lot of times I'd be like, what am I even doing? And like, can I just be partnered with somebody I've worked with before? And yet now I'm so intrigued to like with some, to work with someone with him again, because what we came up with was nothing anywhere close to what we would have expected of each other. So I think that a story only becomes one when there is someone to listen. Conversations only becomes become conversations when there's someone to respond to and somebody who's responding back to you. If we wanna to aspire to be responsibly, socially conscious artists, sharpen our listening skills. That's the first step to true engagement. Um, and then ensemble creation, like I said, is like we connect first, not just by listening with your ears, but with your skin and your nose and your sense of touch and your hair and whatever it is, like listen with your entire body. And then you find that connection and allow yourself to be surprised. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlena. I mean, that was just uh... Um, uh, so um, coming from such a deep place and so authentic, I mean, I feel like you really um, kind of like uh, uh, actually have led me to my next question, which is like, you know, like the world, you, I, I think what happens is it's so difficult. To, we find it so difficult to build solidarity and solidarity starts also with listening. It starts with, uh, you know, just really listening to each other's stories and uh, really hearing each other's stories in, in a way. And so I, I just find that, I mean, that, that story was so illuminating because I feel like often we are so frightened and, uh, and you know, different countries have totally different ways of uh, looking at this. But I, I, one of the things I really do think identity politics is something that is, uh, you know, in, in this country, it could be race, but in another country it's caste or it's, you know, it's other things like that. So that, that or religion that divide us, the things that we, uh, and, you know, so there, there are, there's something really hugely empowering about it. And then there's also something really uh, limited about it as well. Right. Because the, we, we don't we don't want to be boxed ourselves as people of color or as South Asian Indians or whatever that is. So I just wanted to. Um, um, and I know that's why in the Institute, we bring together people in such a deliberate way. We bring together people so such different people in such a deliberate and intentional way so that actually that listening can begin and we can build solidarity. So I guess I'm, I'm really interested, in, especially with this time that we're living in, when the world itself is so divided, we've like really experiencing that everywhere in the world, not just in the United States, it's everywhere. And um, so where, uh, how do we move forward to build solidarity? So, you know, so when the world itself is so divided, how do we kind of, like, what do we do? Just as artists, maybe what your practice is, and maybe uh, Sumi, you can jump in and then 
We'll go this way, Marlena and then Denise. Are you asking me to go first? Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm gonna take it back to what I've been talking about <laughs> gymnastics and movement and stuff because um I've 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 kind of been I'm sure we all have many different hats and lives and careers, not just one or the other, but because I'm a theater artist and I'm engaged with like, you know, enlightened people like yourselves. <laughs> and I think in this sort of like, I'm sorry, sometimes meathead thug kind of sports world. <laughs> um, and politics are pretty different. And um, you know, they're not into truth seeking and whatever. So um I'm finding interesting to kind of figure out a way to bridge the gaps between that, between the two communities. Um, but I do think that because I'm making a theater piece about gymnastics, that it will bring in hopefully people from the, the sports community and people that normally do not go to the theater or they do, they're going to go see like the um, Simone Biles tour, you know, like that type of, um, huge kind of rock star status performance. Um, and I'm hoping to bring in people into like a smaller space that's kind of a little bit more intimate and experimental and like kind of, you know, listening to the truth coming from these kids. Um, and that will help to bridge in, in some small way, those communities. Um, I think that making work that crosses boundaries so that you're not always having the same audience come in where you can maybe reach the people that are not accustomed to seeing live performance or that are don't have the privilege to do that. Um, I think that that's the way to sort of um, to help come to a better understanding by having your stories told to people that don't normally listen. Oh, that is, that is, I mean, I, I feel like you've taken it in such a unique uh, direction. And also it's like, you, this is such, the work that you're doing is so, so unique for lack of a better word, but I seriously, uh, and, and the way you reach out to people and bring in audience, I, I really love it. It's beautiful. Thank you, Sumi, so much. And uh, Marlena, do you want to take that question on? Um, I, mean, I know you, I know you build solidarity. You are like a master uh, or, or maybe a non-gendered word here, but you're really an expert at building uh, solidarity. Because uh, I know I've seen you do it, you do it and, and you do it in a way that, uh, you know, I mean, your play was totally Filipino and it completely had, was in Tag most of the play was in Tagalog and you invited me to come and direct the piece and grab a tag and co-direct the piece with you. I mean, and, and, and then of course I, in, turned back and invited you to co-direct the piece with me right. because I'm like I don't understand half this play and I need Marlena. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, so I, I feel like you practice it in a very vis at a very visceral level. So I would love to, to have you speak about that a little bit. Well thank you for your <laughs> you're trusting me, but I think that I'm a master of any of that. I think that if anything, the reason I keep going into them is because I feel like I don't know anything about it. Like there is like as far as much as like in theater, they say you have stage fright beyond stage fright. I always start from a point of fear, you know, fear that I don't know the answers. And therefore the only way to know the answers is to like go ahead with the fear and, and, and find out the answers. I want to show you something. This is very random, but I'm going to move my computer. Um, this right here in the background is a painting in progress by a Twin Cities-based um, visual artist, Takumba Aiken. And the reason that I have this now is because I visited him one time and we were just talking I, and he goes like, pick any painting, which one do you like best? And I chose this one and I gave it a title. And he goes, well, now that you gave it a title, then you're gonna have to have it. And he just gave it to me. And he said, but then here's something I'm giving you, like, I'm not giving you a completed painting. He goes, this painting is not finished. So I don't know if you want it, maybe I should finish it first. And I'm like, no, I really love that it's an unfinished piece um, because then there's something for us to start with again. 
Um, and I think that I find myself doing that all the time. It's like, where, where are we incomplete? My father used to say, find a gap and fill it. I think it's always led me like, find the gap and fill it. Where is the gap? Where is the synapse? We're like between one synapse and another. Where's that empty space and what message goes from this synapse to another? And where can we revise, re, rewrite the narrative? Because those, the, the field of all possibilities is where there's nothing yet. And that's where I like to go in first. And, but it's frightening. I mean, I, I'm gonna mention again, the experience with, um, with Leslie, um, I don't know if she's still here, but with Leslie Ishi, with when we did the 24 hour festival, we were all given a prompt. The prompt that I was given was, Re made me really nervous. It was like, today I met a Karen woman named Karen. And immediately I'm like, holy schmacks. I cannot write about this. First of all, I'm not Karen. And secondly, the, the prompt itself was so fraught with like, you could be easily derogatory with what you write in there. And, and you have eight hours and I slept until three and then I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, okay, what do you have already? Like what's in your cupboard already? You know, when you're like during the pandemic, the groceries are empty, the shelves are empty. You have to go to your cupboard and find out what's in there. What, can, what dish can I make out of what I have in my cupboard? And I just started from there. It's like, what is it that I have that starts with this? And I remember that a story was told to me about this Karen woman and how she left her son behind when they were escaping from a truck and it started there. And then I remember that I was dealing with my daughter who's now in Brooklyn, who just moved into her place. Um, and that threw in there. And then I looked at the profile of the actors that were assigned to us. And I took bits and pieces of each of them. One of was a Feng Shui art uh, consultant. and like, oh, let's put Feng Shui in here. Um, I had a picture of the apartment of one of the other actors. and the placement of her apartment told me it was so clean. It's like, I want to see it messy. So let's make this character have a messy house. So bits and pieces of it started throwing in there. And then Leslie, of course, brought in her magic. And I don't know how she did it so calmly because she was directing from the airport the whole time we were rehearsing. <laughs> she was online at the airport. You can hear like, okay, flight so-and-so boarding in 15 minutes. Like, Leslie, we've been online for like four hours. You're still at the airport? <laughs> and she was just like, yeah, I don't want to risk it. But the magical experience of it all is that we were all coming in from a strange place, an unknown place. None of us have ever worked with together before. I knew Leslie through the Institute, but we'd never really worked with each other before. And we couldn't even see each other. And I think what came out of that is like, when you look at the places where we're very divergent, is like, that's the most interesting place. Mm. Because the story hasn't been invented yet. You know, it hasn't been birthed yet. So wh why would you want to create something that's already there? Like create something that's not there yet. That's how yeah. you renew the world, right? That's how you are born again. Yeah. And I'm so right now, I'm so obsessed really with working on Black Asian solidarity. When I did the project with Orko, his real given name is David David Bullard, um, but now referring to him as Orko, and some other conversations I've had through the summer uh, since George Floyd happened, that this horrible chasm between Asian and Black narratives is something that we need to address so urgently. Um, and the minute I decided that that's the direction that I'm going to focus on, at least for the coming year, then all these opportunities started falling on my lap without my asking for it. And I knew that that's where I need to play. Thank and you. Thank I'm, you so much, Marlena. Yeah. So I really, really appreciate that. Uh, and, and, you know, that's really important work that, that you're doing. Uh, so I, we have about two minutes left. So I just want to make sure that I give Denise the chance to answer that question. So take us home. Uh, Denise, I know that it's a I'll hard. take you home. Two All right. minutes, just two minutes. I will dovetail off what Marlena was saying about, about fear and then listening. I feel like the older I get, the less I know, or better yet, the older I get, the less that I know I know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like 
I used to be very, this is my identity. This is who I am. I'm these labels, you know, and then I just realized, um, you know, identity is more relational to quote one of my mentors. Um, it's, it's just, it's not the axis of my identity is not here inside of me. It's, and the axis of identity is not in you over here. It's actually in the space between. Mm. And I started to realize that as I, as I traveled internationally and just even across to different communities, the way that I'm perceived is very different the way that I think that I am. And it, it kind of, I have to take that into consideration in particular black Asian relations, as you were saying, Marlena, and just anything, even within my own community, yeah. we're so different as people and that I can't just be so stubborn about this is my belief and it's going to be this way because it's really about listening, deep listening and uh, respecting and understanding and still trying to create work because, you know, we want to do that. And I feel that the work is something it's healing. It's it's I don't even know if it's healing. It's just this thing that we do. And that's that's what I what will leave us with is this is the thing we need to do is create the work and keep creating. Thank you. Thank you so much. You three are just amazing, amazing. What a privilege to talk to all of you. Su such a beautiful, uh, I mean, we are just privileged to know you and uh, privileged to have, to be in your presence when, when we do meet. So thank you so much. We're so lucky. Um, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sumi, Marlena, Denise. So grateful. Yes. And now I would like, you know what, it's a, a practice of our uh, National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation uh, to, um, uh, have uh, you know we, we we've tried we, we've tried with many many practices to decolonize ourselves and so one of our practices is actually to invite witnesses to invite elders uh, to uh, so and, and to kind of recount back in many different ways documentation is one way you know you can take a camera you can record exactly what's happening you can you know write have notes and everything else but there's this other way that we all know best which is storytelling and which is a reflection which many many of our cultures have storytelling and reflecting back as in, in the form of oral. I mean, our cultures are oral and we, you know, our written culture make, came much later for many of us. So I wanna invite Nobuko Miyamoto as our Institute elder who's been at many, many institutes starting 2012 and who we continue to invite back because she is one of the most profound human beings I know and one of the most special. Um, we just, uh, just love her. Her practice is huge. She deserves everything um, and, uh, and, and just deserves to be completely recognized for what she does, which I know she is also, but I also feel like uh, Nobuko is, is uh, uh, one of our favorite people. I mean, I just don't, I'm just speaking from the heart. And so I wanna invite Nobuko uh, to reflect back to us as a witness. You know, she's attended a couple of these sessions this couple of days, she's really busy, her schedule is busy, but she's managed to come here as much as she can. So Nobuko, over to you. <laughs> you gave me a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm so honored and I love you all so much that I can never say no, even though it's hard to, to be here sometimes. I, how can I say no to all this beauty and thought and ambition and, and fearless creativity? It's, it's crazy. <clears throat> so what I do, I don't know. I had to just write down words and I'm going to pick out some of the words and I'm going to just, that's, I don't know how to capture all of it, except I heard words and phrases. <clears throat> and so innovative, adapting, planet, healing, marginalization, listening, watching the world, transforming, reflecting, reinventing, transcending, language of, de of transcending the language of decolonizer Ooh. body body liberation vulnerable intelligence rise up safe intergenerational divergent convergent process deep artists Disrupting, silenced, bursting, silence, bursting, breaking free, not governed by rules, gifted, 
gift, gifting, amazing. Just move. Connect to who you are. Check into your body. Trauma. Stronger humans. Personal storytelling. Own mythology. Own mythology. Improvisation. I didn't know any better. Naked truth. Radical education. Layering. Devising. Where did all this come from? Creating a language. Creating a language the audience begins to understand. New information found in your body, in your body. The world is super complex and contradictory. Our brains will not explode. I love that. Our brains will not explode. Overall, it becomes a melody. Then this thing, blue lipstick, <laughs> high camp, fun. Politics, politics is location, politics of location, experience, experience of spar sparsity teaches abundance. Ooh. Essence is listening, honoring where you are, listening to each other. Adventure. Sunra. <laughs> In clashing, there was so much learning, finding a way to combine. Ensemble, creation, listen with the skin, nose, entire body. There you find connection, solidarity, and a world divided. We don't want to be boxed. We're bridging gaps in small ways sports, arts, go ahead with fear, find the gap and fill it, create something that, you, that hasn't been done. That's how new is born. Identity is relational. It's in between. This is what we do, create work. I am so proud. I'm so amazed. I'm in awe and I'm astounded by Sumi, Marlene. The world is in your hands. Thank you. <laughs> Damn. We just need a bit of silence for, for your, your words to echo in our hearts and soul. Uh, Nobuko, uh, uh, all I have to say is that you live and may you live for a long time. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nubako, for that was such a beautiful list poem of reflection, really. And um, I appreciate your, uh, your listening, your reflecting back to us and all the wisdom that you bring to it and all the heart and spirit that you bring to it always. Thank you so much. We're, we're honored every time we get to be in creative space with you. <laughs> so, uh, hi, Mina and DePunker. We are winding down not only this amazing session, thank you for moderating such a brilliant discussion that was truly, there's just so many insights, uh, so many wonderful quotes, so many ideas to take away and practices from this session and conversation. So thank you so much for leading that conversation. Um, and we are winding down our whole virtual weekend. It went so quickly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so I'm going to invite as we begin our closing process, uh, if you are in a chat in the Zoom room or on a live stream on Facebook or otherwise, 
uh, we'd like to invite your participation in the chat to just um, reflect yourself if you've been with us for these sessions, this session or other sessions throughout the Directing Institute virtual weekend, to reflect what are you taking with you uh, from this weekend's program? What will you keep? What are you taking with you? What will you keep? We'd love to see some of those reflections in the chat. And I think we're gonna do a shout out to staff uh, all staff and tech support of um, Art to Action and Pangea World Theater. We'd love to invite you to put your videos on so we can see you and thank you and say hello. And I think we're gonna have a few words from Suzanne on behalf of Pangea and Tanya on behalf of Art to Action. Um, Suzanne and I had chatted that I would start. Um, I was feeling a little speechless <laughs> because it's been a joy to be backstage and to li listen and witness and uh, take everything in as, as we mark out the cues and make sure that all the, the brilliance that needs to come through this platform does. Um, so thank you for, for trusting me to support this work. It's been a gift um, through the last year of working with Art to Action. I really think about with my background had as a poet, how, how all this work restores context, how poetry is a tool that does that. And I really am starting to reframe and be like, oh yeah, look, art is a tool, a tool that restores context, which is so important in all the complexity we live in. So I'm, I'm so grateful, I'm speechless. Suzanne, where did you go? It's, <laughs> it's, it's your turn to, uh, to, to try and say some things. Oh, there you are, hooray, take it away. You're muted, hold on. Oh, hello, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I was, I was trying to bring up all the staff and we have, we have so many, yeah, little, little spots. Um, yeah, thank you so much for such a beautiful um, weekend. Uh, thank you to all the artists um, throughout the tech process leading up to this beautiful weekend and during the beautiful weekend who welcomed us into their practices and trusted us as a tech team to hold them over the weekend and support and love their beautiful craft. Um, it is an honor to just be um, trusted and supported to hold such beautiful work. Um, and also it's just seeing that that part of the art being built as an ensemble and also just wanting you all know that that's what the tech team does behind the scenes. It's the strongest ensemble that I've ever been a part of um, and how we always hold and have each other from all of the amazing staff at Pangea, amazing staff at Art to Action. Yes, staff at Art to Action, Gabby, yes. Um, and our brilliant note takers um, who also were there and supported us. So just thank you so much. And I would also now quickly love to um, welcome just a star of the weekend, Kayla, really quickly to say something, please. Hello. for you all it's really the honor of of our lives to get to serve y'all in this way and i can't wait until we're back together thank you thank you thank you thank you um everybody uh just want to make sure that um we just really thank everybody the people who spoke and also the people who didn't speak um you know i'm, I'm afraid of mentioning names because i might forget people but i do want to say gabby from up to action thank you uh, Adeline, Molly, Jenny, Katya. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting somebody, but thank yeah. you so much. Uh, and of course, Taya from Hall Around. Uh, couldn't have done that um, without you. Uh, just to thank you. I mean, just the awesome organization, volunteers, all the work that we've done to make this happen. It just takes, it really does take a family to, to get this done in the way that we need to. And, and Andrea, back, back at you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, DePonker. Thank you to all the staff and supporter. I mean, everybody who supports this in so many ways. We're going to close out now uh, with our closing slides, and it is so hard to say goodbye, but we really hope that you'll all stay in touch with us. Um, we want to thank our funders and supporters and partners who have made the Institute, the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation, possible all these years from its beginning idea in 2008, 9, 10, to all the iterations that we've had. And particularly this year, um, funders, uh, the Mellon Foundation and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. And of course, we wanna thank HowlRound and give a shout out to DJ Cotton, whose music you have heard throughout the weekend. 
And uh, we want to encourage you all to stay in touch with Art to Action and Pangea World Theater. Um, your support is always welcome and appreciated. And also you can connect with us on social media at Art to Action at Pangea World Theater on all your uh, favorite platforms. Um, so we hope you will stay connected, um, stay in touch, uh, follow and stay tuned for uh, the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation 2022 programming. And uh, we'll be uh, in touch with you about more of that soon. Take care everyone. And we'll go out with some music by DJ Cotton. Thanks everybody. 